We are joined live in studio now by the Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly. Minister, thank you very much for coming in to talk to us today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Justin. Um, It's reported in the Irish Times yesterday that you asked your officials to examine a possible change in the vaccine rollout programme so that people under the age of 30 would be vaccinated more quickly. Is that something that is now under active consideration? Uh, The short answer is no. Uh, The Irish Times reported in absolutely good faith. Let me be very clear on that. They had asked if this was something that was being considered. I was aware that the original NIAC prioritisation included this option for younger people because we do see more transmission amongst younger people. And what the original NIAC strategy had said was if the data on transmissibility uh, in regard to the vaccines was strong enough, then this was something that should be considered. So earlier in the week, uh, I put the question to the deputy CMO to say, is is the data there? And he, he, uh, he came back and said, uh, no, it isn't. And I mean, on what basis were you, did you come up with that, that proposal? Um, w- was it based on, on, on science? Was it based on expert advice or was this something that you had come up with yourself? No, it was in the original NIAC recommendation specifically that they said 18 to 30. What, I, what the, the, the data we get on age cohorts, there's one age cohort in particular, which is 18 to 24, where, where we see um, consistently a higher rate than we see with some of the other age cohorts. So given that we're always looking at ways to improve the uh, vaccine programme and the effectiveness of the programme, I thought it was timely to ask for a view, given that NIAC had flagged it some okay. time ago. OK, so and that report was out yesterday and you're quoted in that story in the Irish Times, but today you're telling us that now it's not a runner. On what basis is it no longer a runner? Because I got a response from uh, the Deputy CMO who had looked and, and come back and said, no, the, the data on transmissibility is still emerging and it, it, doesn't, it, it isn't at a place yet that would warrant that change. You seem to have blindsided your government colleagues with this one because many of them, I mean, they, they took a lot of heat on defending the age-based rollout when Gardaí and teachers were looking for vaccines and they defended the age-based rollout on that, on that basis. And then yesterday, um, this comes out, uh, you go examining a policy which potentially undermines that. Well, I think everyone would expect in my role as Minister for Health and indeed the people who work on the vaccine programme were constantly pro. Uh, probing the vaccine programme. We want to make sure that it's as effective as possible. The more effective it is, the more lives that are saved and the quicker we can reopen society. And as I said, all we were doing was looking at an existing NIAC position, which was if the data backs it up, then this is something that could be done. All I did was ask if the data backed it up. And and I think people would expect me to be asking questions like that. Of course, you, you asked, but you also gave a quote to the Irish Times and you didn't tell, it seems, your government colleagues and you didn't tell the HSE. I didn't because there was no plan and there was no proposal. All I was doing was asking a asking a question. I think it would be perfectly normal for the Deputy CMO and myself and the task force to, to, to be probing these things on an ongoing basis, which we do. But the Labour Party leader, Alan Kelly, says what you have uh, achieved then is in causing utter confusion uh, with this proposal about uh, how the vaccine rollout programme is going to proceed now. Well, Alan Kelly may be confused. I don't think anyone else is confused. I think it's very, very clear. We are moving on age cohorts. That's the science. We had a recommendation or a position from from NIAC and we simply asked the question. And as I said, Justin, I think people would expect me in my role to be constantly probing and checking back in. If NIAC had said to us, this is something that could be done if the data backed it up, uh, I think it would be expected of me as Minister for Health to be asking exactly those questions. Are you also looking at spacing out vaccine doses over a longer period of time so that more people can get their first dose? We are. We're looking at the mRNA vaccines and asking the question, if we were to extend the four-week interval to eight weeks or indeed 12 weeks, would that have much of an impact? We're asking the question for a very positive reason, which is that the data that we're getting back from the vaccination programme here in Ireland and indeed right around the world is that even the first dose of these two-dose vaccines is showing absolutely incredible positive signs in terms of reduction in cases and reduction in hospitalisations. It it was reported in the Irish Independent yesterday that the Cabinet will look at this on Tuesday, um, this this possibility of extending the interval between doses from that that four-week period up to six or eight weeks. Is that something that we can expect to hear a cabinet decision on this week? We'll have to see. Certainly there's no memo 
uh, being written at the moment. The team are looking at it, the public health officials and the task force are looking at it. But if we do have a recommendation in, in place tomorrow, obviously that is something we can bring to government. But is the push to do this, is it, is it coming from, from you or is it coming from the scientists from NIAC? Because Dr. Colm Henry was on the radio with Katie Hannon yesterday saying it's too early to start pursuing a strategy like this. We don't have that data that you speak about. Well, the the push from all of us is to make sure that the vaccine programme is as effective as possible. Because if we can keep the curve flat, which we're doing uh, as a nation, if we can guard against variants coming in, which is something we're doing through... Uh, quarantining and so forth. But this specific and proposal on spacing out the doses, where, where is that coming from? Um, that, that, that's coming from me, it's coming from public health. It's something that we're, we're all looking at. There's no, there's this, no the, in, in individual trying to, trying to push this. It's just a very sensible question that we're asking and that other, other countries are asking as well. Because ultimately, Justin, the more effective and the more efficient we can make this vac- vaccination programme, the quicker we can open up society. Okay. It's coming from you, but have you sought the advice of NIAC on this? Um. I've sought the advice of the deputy uh, CMO on this. Okay, but what about the National Immunisation Advisory Committee, which ultimately makes decisions on on these things? Yeah, the deputy CMO will be talking to NIAC NIAC about that. But the the way it works is NIAC make recommendations to Dr. Glynn and then Dr. Glynn makes recommendations to me. Okay, so Dr. Glynn then will be talking to NIAC, will he? I've no doubt he's already talking to NIAC about it and and Dr. Glynn and I will be sitting down in in, in the coming days looking at the the various options. Okay, and and if the doses were to be spaced out, that would be a very attractive prospect, wouldn't it? Politically, because it would mean that you would achieve more people getting their first dose much earlier in the summer than ha- had originally been planned? Well, well, I, I think put the politics aside because really I don't think politically th- th- that's But you said matters. this is coming from you, a politician, so... Uh, well, <laughs> sure, but, but as Minister for Health... like the, the, It's not coming the, from a clinician. The focus here... Well, it's being investigated by Dr Glynn okay. as, as on, well, on right? Your, on, uh, after you asked him, yes. So the focus is on having as effective a vaccine uh, program as possible and reopening society as quickly as possible. So it, it's not about politics. It's about us all recognising the huge sacrifice that have been made and the fact that every single one of us wants to get back to normality as quickly as possible. And the root to that is three things. It's stopping the variants coming into the country. It's suppressing the virus here at home and then critically having as efficient a vaccine program as possible. And when will you know if spacing out the doses is going to happen or not? When, when will you have that advice back? I, I expect a a recommendation in the coming days. Okay. Now, there's a report in, in the Sunday Times today by Justine McCarthy saying that Ireland's Catholic archbishops are aggrieved at the ban on religious services, particularly uh, that such services have been made a criminal offence by a statutory instrument which you signed uh, last week. I mean, did, did, why did you go so far as to make attending religious services a criminal offence? We didn't. I've actually got the the statutory instrument uh, here in front of me and uh, it doesn't do that. What it does is it bans uh, large indoor gatherings and we all know why because the public health advice says that that is a high risk area. Um, I am very conscious and government is very conscious that uh, people desperately want to get back to being able to go to mass. It's such an important part of people's lives. As soon as the public health advice uh, is such that it is deemed safe. I can I can assure you that that is something we'll do. My understanding is that the archbishops would like to me to discuss this, and obviously I'd be very very happy to do that. Okay, and and what they're saying is that you know they're taking legal advice on this, saying that it is a potential infringement of religious freedom and constitutional rights. I mean, is it is is that is that what it potentially could be? Is it a step too far? It's the position that we've been in for quite some time. So so I'm not entirely sure why it's being raised as an issue now. Uh, it, it has been the case for, for a long time. It's been identified by public health. And it, it, it isn't about uh, mass uh, or worship. It's about uh, indoor gatherings, which are high risk. What we are What we are always motivated by is safety, trying to keep people safe. And this is the current public health advice. But I want to re-emphasise um, it, the bans on indoor gatherings, they're not done lightly. We're very, very aware. I am acutely conscious uh, that this is a very, very serious imposition for a lot of people around this country. And as soon as the public health advice uh, is to relax these, we will do it straight away. Was it really necessary, though? Because there's no 
evidence is there of widespread non-compliance among um, religious communities, is there? Like I say, the, the measure isn't focused specifically at uh, religious communities or indeed any other communities. The, the measure is focused explicitly at indoor gatherings and we have more and more information showing that uh, indoor is significantly more dangerous when it comes to the spread of COVID-19 than outdoor. Did this have anything at all to do with Declan Ganley's legal challenge, which he's taking through the courts, challenging restrictions on, on church attendance? No, not at all. As I say, it's about it's about indoor gatherings, which the public health advice say are high risk, uh, high risk events. A huge progress has been made at a very, very high cost. We need to protect that and that, that is what this is about. OK. In just over a week now, the government will set out a plan for the further reopening of society. Are we going to get a plan at that stage for the full summer? Uh, that hasn't been decided yet, but what we do know is that we are in a, we're actually in a better place, Justin, a significantly better place than uh, was anticipated even four weeks ago. So if we go back four weeks to when the cabinet was looking at the measures for April and what might be considered for May, the best case scenario was that we would reach about a thousand cases a day before bending the curve back down again. Actually, what's happened is for this week and last week, the OR number has remained below one, which means cases slowly but steadily are decreasing. What that means is we can look at the full uh, list that was set out uh, two or three weeks ago in terms of uh, Monday week. Obviously, there's some things uh, opening tomorrow. There's more then ready to go on Monday week. And it puts us in a very positive position for the conversation about May, June and July. Certainly, if we can keep... Uh, the plan going. We have a plan. The plan is working. If we, if it continues to work and if we continue to bend down the curve and get these vaccines out, we can be having a very, very positive and encouraging conversation about the summer. There are plenty of stories in the newspapers uh, today about what the summer might look like and a report in the, the Mail on Sunday today um, talking about retail resuming in mid-May, inter-county travel in early June, indoor dining in July. Is any of that out of line with your thinking at the moment? So those conversations haven't been had uh, either by the COVID committee or indeed by, by the full cabinet. What we do know is that what is under consideration from the start of May is full opening of uh, construction, non-essential retail, uh, recommencement of personal services, museums, galleries, libraries, religious services and so forth. And the, and the mail saying here is summer of restaurants, retail, home holidays and outdoor pubs. Is that what we're looking at for the summer? Can you give people some hope of that? What I can say, we don't have any advice from Neffet on that right now and no decisions have been have been made along those lines. What I can say is that we are ahead of the best case scenario we were given four weeks ago. And critically, so Dr. Glynn and I had a, a debrief after Neffet on Thursday evening. It's the most positive post-Neffet meeting I've ever had uh, with a CMO or, or, or deputy CMO. And, and Dr. Glynn said something very important. He said, you know, What's really, really impressive and encouraging about the fact that the OR number is still below one, he said, is it's probably not the vaccination programme because because of the levels and the cohorts. He said, actually, what has happened is that the public have heard the message again, once more stepped up, kept the social contacts down. So close contacts, for example, which normally go up uh, before we see a surge, have remained steady at 2.6. And I just want to re-emphasise my view and, 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 and Dr Glynn's view in that meeting, that the people of Ireland deserve huge credit for stepping up once again to bend that curve down. There is growing concern, though, about uh, a new variant um, w- which is circulating now in the in the UK, the so-called Indian variant. And there's concern because there's a lot of uncertainty about the effectiveness of vaccines on that variant. Um, are we in this country, are you possibly looking at additional restrictions to ward against that variant arriving in Ireland? All of the variants around the world are being looked at on a weekly basis by uh, by the public health team. But the deputy CMO and I were actually just talking about the Indian variant this morning. Uh, it will be looked at this week, but I want to re-emphasise there has been no discussion whatsoever uh, in terms of uh, additional countries being added to any list. We, we have to let the public health experts uh, look at the variant and come back with recommendations. There are 77 cases identified in the UK at the moment. Um, if you wanted to stop that variant from coming into Ireland, what would you do? 
There, well, there's, I can tell you there have been no conversations about the UK being added to, to, to any additional list. But what, what we'll do is what we always do, which is we let the experts look at the information uh, from multiple sources and then come back with recommendations. And then those recommendations can be discussed by Cabinet. OK, I want to ask you about uh, quarantine because you signed new regulations yesterday, which will mean that fully vaccinated people won't have to enter hotel quarantine, but they will have to quarantine at home. Um, why, if they are fully vaccinated, uh, can it, can, can, why can't they do what everybody else who is fully vaccinated in society can do and, and meet other people? It's all about trying to get the, the right balance in place. So the question for us is, what is a proportionate response to the risk of people coming into the country? And the public health advice right now is that the proportionate response to people who are coming in who are fully vaccinated uh, is that they should go into home quarantine, which is, by the way, what everybody has to do who isn't from one of the Category 2 countries. And in that case, they have to go into hotel quarantine. The aviation sector this week raised some serious concerns about its own viability if people are going to have to continue to quarantine when they come into this country. Can can you tell them, what are the criteria for ending mandatory hotel quarantine? Well, first of all, can I say that the aviation industry has had a horrific time. It absolutely has. And the, the downside for them of mandatory hotel quarantine is it is doing exactly what it was set up to do, which is to stop people coming into the country. We've seen a very, very significant reduction. And of course, while that is absolutely the right thing to do and absolutely the right thing to do from a public health perspective, of course, it is very, very hard for the aviation industry. On a positive note, uh, where we are going with this is an EU digital cert or green cert so that at least within the EU, and I've no doubt that other countries would end up joining it, in the coming months for people who are fully vaccinated, we would have an international verification mechanism which would allow for free travel within the EU and, and, and potentially more countries and, as well. And, and is and really it only at that out. point, that's the point then when hotel quarantine will end, is it? When that um, green travel cert is, is in circulation? Well, hotel, the, the question is what countries would hotel quarantine end for? So certainly my hope is that the entire EU and others, EEA, UK, North America, places where we can have reciprocal verification of vaccination, uh, that we would have absolutely free free travel for people who are vaccinated. And the reality is the vast majority of people are going to be vaccinated. However, there may be other countries where we can't verify or indeed who haven't got uh, big vaccination programmes who are identified as high-risk variant of concern countries. All right, Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly, thank you very much indeed for coming in to talk to us today.